Good morning. Open your Bibles with me to Exodus chapter 20, please. It is a great honor to be able to speak with you this morning. I have my wife, Sarah, with me. She's down here in front. We're going to be married 34 years on Saturday. Yeah, it is good. It's really good. My daughter, Olivia, son-in-law, Dan, my mom, a lot of friends here, so thank you for coming. It's good to see all of you. I I grew up in a pastor's home, so I'm a PK. (laughs) Yeah, there's a lot of you here, I know. I've asked that question before. It's amazing how many PKs and MKs we have. And uh, my father and I had a really good relationship. We did a lot of things together. One of the things that we did was golf. And uh, when I was a little boy, he bought me a set of golf clubs, and uh, then I graduated out of them into regular clubs. And, and because he was a pastor, he had a lot of friends that were also pastors who golfed, and so sometimes we would go, and there'd be other pastors that were there. And there was one pastor who was a friend of my dad who was a really amazing golfer. He was a scratch golfer, which means he played par, and his, his swing was mechanical. He was, he was just like a machine. He was just so precise. And one day he came to my dad and he said, would it be possible, he said, my, my youngest son, um, he, he's, I think he's probably about eight years old, he's never been golf and I'd like to take him golf and would it be possible for maybe um, you and John and me and my son to go golfing someday, just the four of us have a day together. And so that sounded good. I had this, this old set of youth clubs, so we gave him the clubs and the day came that we went golfing. And, uh, and we're up on the first tee and this father, you know, he tees up a ball and uh, he hands his little guy, I think his name was Mark, he hands him this driver and he says, okay, take a few practice swings. So, you know, he's, he's doing one of these things and he finally goes, okay, all right, go ahead, step up and hit it. So he goes, whoosh, totally missed the ball, whiff. And, you know, he looks up at his dad and his dad said, that's one. I kind of I kind of looked at my dad's like, "What? <laughs> what just happened?" He says, "Practice again." So, swing, swing, whiff. That's two. This kid's never been golfing before. He's got big, wide eyes. <laughs> His dad says, "Practice again." Swing, swing, whiff. That's three. By this time, this poor little kid's crying <laughs> and, and I look over at my dad and it's like oh dear Jesus God please let him connect please just let him connect swing swing whiff that's four I mean he finally finally connects and it you know dribbles down can you imagine how long that day was so <laughs> that day happened over 40 years ago, and I have thought about it over and over again. Just, let's do a quick, quick little survey. How many of you think that's good parenting? How many think that's terrible parenting? Okay, well, so for the first 30 years or so that I was recalling this story, I was in the that's terrible parenting category because I was thinking to myself, thank you, Lord, that my dad was not that way. Otherwise, I'd be one of those PKs that you know about that's serving hard time somewhere, probably, right? (laughs) But there came a point a few years ago when I began to view that whole story and that whole memory differently. Because I realized that as strange as his behavior seemed to me, that father pastor was actually very accurately representing the character of God's holiness. Because in golf, every stroke does count. So if this sermon introduction messes with your head like I hope it will, (laughs) it's because if you're like me, you want to think of God the Father as the kind of father who just gives you whiff after whiff after whiff after whiff. That's grace. 
but God is also a holy father. And every stroke has to count. And that's called the fear of God, which is what I want to talk to you about today. And so what I hope to do in the next few minutes is to speak about the fear of the Lord, go to a number of passages of scripture, and my hope is that the Lord opens up our hearts and minds and amps up at least a couple notches in all of our thinking about what is the fear of the Lord. I mean, we talk about the fear of the Lord a lot. We sing about the fear of the Lord a lot. And I think it's an important thing because yeah, Dr. White's been going through the book of Proverbs. There's a verse that's repeated multiple times in Proverbs. It's in Psalms, it's in Job, it's in Micah. And the phrase is, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom, right? So to understand the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. Or if I can put this a different way, if it is the beginning of wisdom, then we cannot really understand anything rightly if we don't grasp rightly the fear of the Lord. So I want to take you to a couple passages of scripture that I hope will help us this morning put this in the right biblical perspective. What is the fear of the Lord? You may have heard sermons before where the preacher got up and he said, now the fear of the Lord, when we're talking about the fear of the Lord, we're talking about a fear that is a reverential awe and respect, right? Not a terror and dread kind of fear. We're talking about reverential awe and respect, have you heard sermons where that's the definition of what the fear of the Lord is? I've preached that sermon and I've preached it very sincerely. I've done the word studies in Hebrew and tried to figure out what this really means. And I think that the reason that we like that particular definition of the fear of the Lord, it's reverential awe and respect, is because the terror and dread kind of fear does not fit with the picture Jesus painted of God the Father in the parable of the prodigal son. But the reverential awe and respect kind of fear does fit with the prodigal son picture, right? And that's the kind of father that we really like and so because we want it to fit with the prodigal son picture, we extract all the teeth out of the definition of the fear of the Lord. So before we get to our passage in Exodus chapter 20, I want you to remember the passage of scripture in Isaiah chapter six that we just sang about. We just sang that phrase, holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. It's taken from Isaiah chapter six. And in that chapter, Isaiah the prophet is transported to heaven and he sees God high and lifted up sitting on the throne. Do you remember this picture? And the smoke is filling the temple. And there are these two magnificent angels that have not two wings, they have six wings. With two, they're covering their face and the top half of their body. With two, they're covering the rest of their body. With two, they're flying and they're calling out to each other, holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. The whole earth is filled with his glory. And Isaiah is brought right into the center of this and the ground underneath him is shaking and quaking and he strokes his beard and, beard and he says, wow, I really respect you. <laughs> like, I, I really, I'm in awe right now. Right? No, that's not what he says, right? What does he do? What kind of fear does he really have? He has the dread and terror kind of fear. He falls on his face and he's trembling and he says, woe is me for I am undone. And I think that when we pull the teeth out of the concept of what the fear of God truly is, we're doing that for our benefit. But somewhere in our soul, in the naked corner of our soul, we recognize that if we stand in the presence of God, we will be just like Isaiah with a dread and terror kind of fear covering us. So how do we understand this concept of the fear of the Lord? Because it's gotta be balanced with the picture that Jesus paints of God's love and grace 
in the New Testament, right? So, so what is this fear of the Lord thing? How is the fear of the Lord the beginning of wisdom? And there's this passage that I'm having you turn to in Exodus chapter 20, I think is a very, a very helpful passage of scripture. I found this passage of scripture years ago and, and it, um, it twisted my mind to the point where I just, I thought about it over and over again and I never really could get my arms around it, but I think perhaps, um, I, I think perhaps I am beginning to apprehend what it means. So in this passage in Exodus chapter 20, it's a famous passage of scripture. If you're looking at your Bibles, it's probably got the heading, the 10 commandments, right? So here's the setup. God speaks to Moses on Mount Sinai and he says, I want to come down and visibly speak to the people. I want them to see me. I want them to know me. And in three days, I'm gonna visibly come down on Mount Sinai and I'm going to speak with them. So you go down and you tell them to get ready, to prepare themselves, to consecrate themselves for that day. And so Moses goes down, tells them it's gonna happen. And sure enough, three days later, God descends visibly and he speaks in a thunderous voice so that they can hear. Visibly and audibly, he descends on Mount Sinai to give the Ten Commandments. And when he does it, he does it full on with all of the surrounding effects of his holiness and his glory. And in Exodus chapter 27, it says, there's this thick cloud that descends on the mountain and then there's lightning and then there's thunder and then there's a trumpet sound, a blast, a scary trumpet sound and then there's fire and smoke and then the ground, the whole mountain starts to shake. And God gives the 10 commandments. And if you are in Exodus chapter 20, I want you to look at what the people's response was. In verse eight, this was their response. Verse 18, I'm sorry. Exodus 20, verse 18. All the people perceived the thunder and the lightning flashes and the sound of the trumpet and the mountain smoking. And when the people saw it, they trembled and stood at a distance. And they said to Moses, Speak to us yourself and we will listen, but let not God speak to us or we will die. They have the kind of response to God that we could put in that description. This is what the fear of God really looks like when human beings encounter the presence of God in scripture. So now here's the verse that speaks to us about the fear of the Lord. This is what Moses says in verse 20. Moses said to the people, do not be afraid. For God has come in order to test you and in order that the fear of him may remain with you so that you may not sin. Did you catch that? Do not be afraid, but the Lord has come so that the fear of him will remain with you. Well, this is using this word, fear of the Lord, in two extreme opposite ways in the same verse. Don't be afraid, but God has come so that the fear of him is gonna be in front of you all the time so you will not sin. So which is it? Are we to not be afraid or to be afraid? Yes, (laughs) right? It's both. It is the grace of God and the fear, the holiness of God. And it's not an either or. It is a both. And the verse that is central here is that the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. (laughs) So he says, do not be afraid for God has come to you in order that the fear of him may remain with you so that you will not sin. There is every reason in the world for us to fear God with the dread and terror kind of fear. In this particular passage of scripture, God's perfect, pure, righteous holiness is totally on display. There is no escaping from the judgment that these people know they are due. He has just given the 10 commandments and now he is there in front of them visibly. The ground is shaking beneath them and they're saying, Moses, you talk to us, otherwise we're dead. 
And the reason is because in the presence of God, we all know incontestably, he can judge us for everything that he knows is true about us. The 10 commandments have told us we're not to take his name in vain. He knows every time we do. We're not to lie. He knows every time we do. We're not to covet. We're not to dishonor our parents. We're not to steal. We're not to commit adultery. We're not to murder, whether in actuality or just in our hearts. He sees it even when nobody else can see it. And he is there in their presence. And that is what the fear of God is all about because against a holy God, in the presence of a holy God, all of us deserve uncontestable sentence of death. God's presence is all thunder and lightning and fire and smoke. And there's a passage in the book of Hebrews that's a commentary on this very scene. And in Hebrews chapter 12, it's, it's talking about how the mountain was shaking and Moses himself is shaking. And that passage in, in Hebrews chapter 12 ends with this little line, our God is a consuming fire. So I'm talking about the fear of the Lord. And our definition of the fear of the Lord has got the teeth taken out of it and we have done God's word a disservice by taking the teeth out of it. But what I love about this verse is it says, do not be afraid for God has come. God has come. He came to us. It says he came to test us. And it's not because he has to test us to see what's going on in our hearts and lives because he already knows that. He's God. God's tests aren't for his benefit. God's tests are for our benefit. So he comes to us to test us and help us know our own hearts and the purpose is so that we would understand the fear of God and that his fear would remain in us or literally remain continually before our faces. And I don't think he wants our, his, the fear of him to be um, in front of our faces all the time so that we'll be in a perpetual state of terror. But he wants it to be continually in front of us so that an awareness of his presence keeps us from sin. That's what it says. He is testing us so that we will fear him so that we may not sin. And that is the test that we can ask ourselves, do I have a real good comprehension of what the fear of God is? It's how do I think about my sin? Am I fine with my sin? Am I okay with my sin? Do, do I feel like, well, God's just giving me whiff after whiff after whiff because that's the kind of father that I want? Or does the fear of God put within us the kind of response and attitude to our sin that God, our father, our holy righteous father also has? So I want you to hear me very carefully. In this verse, in verse 20, you have this balance between don't be afraid, but be afraid. And this is the struggle that we have because when we study God's word, we, we know his grace, we love his grace, we're drawn to his grace, but the Bible also tells us our God never changes. And this is a holy, righteous God. And someday, we're going to, like Isaiah, like the children of Israel, like every person who's ever encountered God fall on our face because we know he is holy. So how do you balance these things together? Because the reality is we do sin. It doesn't matter how afraid you are of God, how, how deep your fear might be, we will all continually sin. We sin over and over again. And that is why when God comes to them, the very next thing that he says to them in Exodus chapter 20 is all about how they cover their sin when they sin. It's about sacrifice. So the next thing he says to Moses is, this is how you're gonna bring your sacrifices. You'll bring an innocent animal, you'll shed its blood, and you will then have your sin covered by that sacrifice. Can you imagine how horrible it would be to over and over and over again have to see an innocent animal bleed out to cover your sin and have to do that over and over again. 
because you continually are sinning. If we had to still do sacrifices today and we had to watch innocent animals have their throats slit and bleed out for us, it would accomplish this. It would keep the fear of the Lord continually before our faces. And we would have the proper attitude toward our sin that God has, the same attitude that our sin is nothing less than pure rebellion against him. It's not just a whiff. Every stroke counts. So God gave them sacrifice so that they could deal with their sin, so that their sin could be covered because they would have to face God someday. But there are not enough animals in the barnyard to cover our rebellion. Which is why God came again. This time he comes as a little baby. God the son comes again to us and he wraps himself in our flesh and he comes not to put the fear of God continually before our face but to demonstrate the love of God that is continually before our face because of what Jesus has done. But the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom and we cannot understand what Jesus does if it is not in the contrast with the backdrop of a proper fear of God. And so when Jesus comes and he's holding out the love of God in front of our faces, it's very easy for us to feel overly comfortable in his presence. But the very last thing that Jesus has to do, that he came to do, is a reminder again of the fear of God, the holiness of God, because the last work Jesus does is he goes to the cross and that innocent sacrifice willingly lays down and lets his hands be nailed and his feet be nailed and lets God lay our rebellion and our sin and our iniquity on him so that God could punish him. He endured the fear of God for us because every stroke counts. And Jesus died. If that were the last scene that we have of Jesus' ministry on earth, then the fear of God would always dominate everything else. But God says, don't be afraid. I've raised Jesus from the dead. Because everything that Jesus accomplished on the cross totally satisfied God's holy, righteous demands against our iniquity. So God wants the fear of the Lord to be continually in front of our faces so that we will have an understanding of how amazing his grace is. We don't have to bring sacrifices all the time. We don't have to be reminded through the the shedding of the blood of an innocent animal. But we hold the cross in front of us all the time because it was there that Jesus shed his precious blood for our iniquity. Do you understand what I'm trying to say? My my point here is this. Every stroke must count. Jesus took our strokes, every one of them on the cross. And if we have the right understanding of how holy and righteous God is, That's the only way we can understand how amazing the grace is. If we aren't gripped by the fear of God, then the grace of God cannot grip us. And he offers us this amazing gift, forgiveness. He's gonna exchange my sin for his righteousness. He's gonna give me eternal life when I fall down before him and I hold the cross continually before my eyes and recognize that this awesome God, who I will someday fall down on my face, is the one who'll say, don't be afraid. I've covered your sin. So the question that we have to ask is, have I lost the fear of the Lord, or do I, have, do I live in such a way that the fear of the Lord helps me? Is it a deterrent in my life, a deterrent from sin, in order for me to honor and glorify this God. So I've got one last passage of scripture that I wanna just kinda talk to you about. You don't have to turn there, but 
in Genesis chapter 31. In Genesis chapter 31, it's the story of Jacob. So Jacob, you know about Jacob, right? And his, his wives and how he had to work for his wives and his father-in-law kept cheating him. So Jacob has taken his wives and his children and all of his possessions and he's fleeing. And as he's fleeing, his father-in-law Laban catches up to him. And in Genesis chapter 31, they have this come to Jesus moment. And Jacob is letting him have it. You have cheated me over and over again. I've worked hard for you. And, and then he, he concludes by saying this. This is what he says in Genesis 31, 42. If the God of my father, the God of Abraham, and the fear of Isaac had not been for me, surely now you would have sent me away empty-handed. I think that's really fantastic. He says, if if the God of my fathers, the God of Abraham, and the fear of Isaac had not been with me. (laughs) I believe that Isaac is the only person in the Bible whose name for God was fear. And it makes sense. Because when Isaac was a little boy, in Genesis chapter 22, God told his father Abraham, I want you to sacrifice your son, your only son, as a burnt offering for me on a mountain. And Isaac went with his dad and, and Abraham put the wood on him. And had him carried up the mountain. And then his father Abraham put the stones and built an altar and put the wood on top of it. And then he bound his son Isaac hand and foot and laid him on top of that wood on top of the altar. And he took out a knife and he was ready to slay Isaac. And that only then was God the Father stopping him. And this is what God the Father says to Abraham in Genesis chapter 22. Now I know that you fear me because you have not withheld your son, your only son from me. So can you imagine Isaac growing up with that memory in his mind? It's no wonder his name for God is fear. God is terrifying, holy, just, But he's also gracious because when he stopped his father's hand, he provided a ram to be the sacrifice. And what I think is just just so amazing in scripture is that when God is giving Abraham these instructions, he says, I want you to go to basically to Mount Sinai, what would someday be called the city of Jerusalem. And he says, I want you to offer on the mountain. It's not exactly what he says. He doesn't say I want you to offer on the mountain. He says, I want you to offer him as a sacrifice on one of the mountains that I'll show you. It's not the mountain in Jerusalem. It's one of the mountains in Jerusalem. And I believe that the spot that God took Abraham and Isaac to was the exact same spot that Jesus was crucified on. Because the whole thing that God was doing with Abraham and Isaac was giving them a clear picture of his holiness and a clear picture of his grace. Because on that very spot, God would provide our only hope that someday when we stand before him, we will not have to fear him with total dread and terror Because he will come forward and claim us as his own by faith in his son, Jesus Christ. And by the blood that he shed for our sin on our behalf. We've looked at a lot of scripture this morning. I've kind of taken you back and forth to a number of places. My hope is that we never think about the fear of the Lord in the same way. We don't take it for granted. We don't act like we deserve it. If all of wisdom must begin with the fear of the Lord, we come to God's word and we say, because I fear you, I trust your word. I'm gonna live according to your word. Whatever it says, I am not gonna be pulling the teeth out of your word. I'm gonna let you speak to me. And may we never be the same. May we never sing the same about the fear of God. So there's a song that we sing that has this phrase, 
Our God is a consuming fire, a burning holy flame with glory and freedom. Our God is the only righteous judge, ruling over us with kindness and wisdom. So we will keep our eyes on you. We will keep our eyes on you so we can set our hearts on you. Lord, we will set our hearts on you. Our God is a consuming fire, a burning holy flame with glory and freedom. And Lord, you're not only a God that we should fear, that is who you are and you are unchanging. You are holy and righteous. All terror and fire and smoke and thunder. But Lord, you are all love and grace. We cannot begin to comprehend how amazing your love is, how deep your love was for us because you delivered your only son over for us so that we could become unbound and go free and live. And Lord, the beginning of our understanding of how amazing your love is starts with a better appreciation for how much we need to fear you. So God, would you put the right kind of fear in our hearts to love you and to serve you, but to fear you. And may that shape the way we understand who you are and the purpose that you have in our lives. And may it make us thankful for the great love that you've shown us through Jesus Christ. Help us never to take that for granted until someday you make us your very own in your presence forever. I pray this in Jesus' strong name. Amen. God bless you. Have a great day.